Series 2022, an initiative by Technovanza VJTI. This is Samrithi Darak, and I am thrilled to be your host for today. VJTI was established in the year 1887, and it is upholding its proud legacy for over a century, filled with brilliance and educational prowess. It has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of society. Technovanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. The renowned line of the guest lecture series over the years has added immense values to the lives of young and prospering minds. Pioneers of diverse fields, including late Dr. A.P.J. Abdul Kalam, Mr. Narayan Murthy, Mr. Ratan Tata, Dr. John Mather. and many others have added a cherry to the glory of technovanza while progressively illuminating young minds to new areas of interest behold because today we are here to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries our guest for today is dr david weinland sir has received a ba degree from the university of california berkeley in 1965 and a phd from harvard university in 1970 Following a postdoctoral position at the University of Washington in Seattle, he joined the Time and Frequency Division of NIST, that is National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado, from 1975 to 2017, where he was a group leader and a NIST fellow. He is now a Philip H. Knight Distinguished Research Chair and a research professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Oregon in Eugene. Dr Weinland has worked on increasing the precision of atomic spectroscopy. This research has applications in making better atomic clocks and has led to experiments that enable precise control of atomic energy levels and atomic motion. For this work, he has been awarded the 2012 Nobel Prize in Physics. Sir, this small introduction wouldn't do enough justice to you. You have blended the eloquent qualities of hard work and persistence with absolute sublimity, which can never be unseen. We are truly honored by your presence today. We also have with us here today the director of PJTI, Dr. Dhiren Patel Sir, and the dean of student activities and alumni, Dr. Rohin Daruwala Sir. Director Sir, I request you to kindly say a few words. so you are mute yeah good morning everyone it is indeed a great privilege and pleasure to host uh, dr minland today uh, who is a august nobel laureate and has a, has given immense contribution through his research team in the field of atomic clock vjti established in 1887 has pioneered the capacity building specifically technology capacity building in the sark region for more than 134 years and we have been striving to keep our pole position and uh, uh, taking our technology to the society i welcome everyone to hear doctor and his uh, uh, you know insights about technology science and the future thank you thank you sir we will also have a q and a session after the lecture so please leave your questions in the live chat below so without any further ado let's be a part of conversation regarding our part to be a change and self reflect under the guidance of clearly the best sir passing it to you now well thank you for the Thank you for the nice introduction. Uh, let me see. Yes, we get it. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for the nice introduction. And as you've heard, I'm going to talk a little bit about atomic clocks. Um, so I might start off by saying, you know, why you know we want precision clocks, and I can give you a couple of reasons why. Um, and I'll describe. The, you know the basic ideas behind atomic clocks, and if I if I do it right, but you should be able to go out and build your own clock. Uh, and uh, and and what's happened in the last decade or so is that uh, the you know we we've gone to optical frequencies in the clocks. Uh, so 
And I'll say why that's interesting. And uh, so what I'm going to do is I, I spent, I, I spent since my graduate school working on clocks, and I'm going to use examples from when I was at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. And, uh, but, the, you know, there's many other efforts going on, on around the world, uh, both using atomic ions and, and neutral atoms. So uh, there's a lot of overlap with what we do uh, and what other people do. And I'll try to get an idea where things stand right now and where the future might go. So what, what the answer to the first question, uh, why precise clocks? Well, one, one thing, at least uh, for centuries, uh, they've been used in navigation. And to give you a little, just a little bit of the history, uh, so, so, you know, if, uh, if sailors on the ocean uh, uh, would, could navigate both uh, for line, lines, <laughs> lines of latitude, that is north-south and, and, and lines of longitude, and to, do, to, to obtain latitude, basically the idea is, is that uh, the observer would side on maybe in the northern hemisphere of the North Star, and uh, and and he would determine the angle with his sextant, the the angle between his line of sight and the and the level ground, and this then this angle uniquely determines where you are in terms of north and south, and uh, so the the idea of longitude is exactly the same. the 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 problem is that uh, uh, you know that that you'll you'll sight on some fixed star and you'll measure the angle, but the but the issue is that the, you know that this angle depends on time due to the rotation of the Earth. And just to give an idea of errors in precision, uh, I, I won't walk you through this simple calculation, but uh, this you know the uh, an error in distance in uh, east-west direction. Uh, is related to the error in time. And just to give one example, if, if we had clocks good enough to, to do timing at one second, then we could, uh, uh, we could navigate, find precision in, in east-west direction to about half a kilometer. And there's, a, there's an interesting history about this that supposedly in the, in the, the early 1700s, the, the British uh, lost a number of uh, sailing vessels because uh, simply because they couldn't do accurate navigation. So, so there was the, the British Parliament in 1714 sponsored what they called the Longitude Act. And it would be a, it would be a prize would be of 30, 20,000 pounds would be given if someone could make a clock that could, could reach this precision. So it's, it's actually much you know, uh, weaker than what I've shown up here. But, but basically, one thing you have to remember is that the sailors, they, they needed to hold the time for months that they might be on the, on the ocean. So it had to be stable to the about two minutes over many months. And there's uh, just as a little side thing, there's, oops, there's a interesting story that, uh, sorry, uh, that John Harrison, uh, a clockmaker in England was actually, you know, satisfied the prize. And anyway, there's a good I, a, a book I liked. Uh, you'll find this, if you can find this person, if you Google, her name on the web, and she's written a non-technical account of, of this problem of the longitude and the longitude act. And I mean, so it's it's partly an interesting story because he, 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 uh, John Harrison actually satisfied the requirements of the prize, and then the parla <laughs> parliament was kind of dragging their heels on giving him the award. And finally, a king had to step in to make sure that he got this prize. And that was, of course, a considerable amount of money in those days. So modern, I think all, almost all of you know that modern navigation is done uh, using satellites. And so the, the key idea there is that, uh, well, you assume we have an observer on the earth and uh, say a particular satellite, I'll, I'll, I'll expand on this, there's more than one satellite, but uh, basically the idea is you wanna, you know, wanna, wanna rely on the synchronization of clocks. And so for example, if the clocks are perfectly synchronized and you know, the, the, the actual protocol is more complicated than this, but let's just say that we agree that the, 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 the clock on board the satellite will emit a pulse of radiation every second. And then basically the distance from the, of the satellite to, to you or the observer on the earth is just given by the speed of light times the, 
the 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 time of emission versus the or time of reception versus time of emission. And so just to give an idea there, if we can if we can hold our clocks in, in synchronism to about a nanosecond, that gives very high precision down to about 30 centimeters. And this is roughly where the, the satellites are uh, these days. I think that the military has even more precise ones, but this gives a, an idea of the of the size. And this so this this precision in time also corresponds to the that expressed fractionally also expresses the, the precision of frequency need, uh, the tick rate over, say, a, a given, given day for, for this number here. Oops, sorry. So, of course, uh, the, the GPS is more complicated, and basically, it's, you know, this the system is overdetermined and they can do. The satellites can do checks between themselves and so on. So the basic idea is that then by determining by that previous protocol that the distance from various satellites and they're in a network, a, you know, not a two-dimensional network as I show here, but then the, the person can act, act exactly find out where he is on the on the surface of the earth. So um, so what about clocks? And I think the, you know, most physicists and most physicists don't have any different idea about clocks than the person, the non-technical person. Basically, uh, you just need some periodic event generator, and then you, you count cycles of this oscillation to generate time. And excuse me. so the traditional periodic event generators are, say, the rotation of the Earth, of course. And then uh, actually starting 150 years or more than that ago, the uh, the pendulum clocks actually got very accurate, so they they, they were they were the most accurate clocks 150 years or so ago. Uh, so these days, uh, what I'm going to talk about is how we used atoms, and and so the idea there is not is not so different uh, than the pendulum clock. Uh, I, I show here, uh, you know, well in this in this cartoon down here, this is sort of the classical picture of say electrons going about the nucleus, and that. As far as the clocks go, that's a pretty good picture. You know, being quantum mechanics, though, we tend to think about superpositions of, of two energy levels. And when we make these superpositions, uh, the, uh, there's an electric, for an electric dipole transistor, and there's an oscillation of the electron density that's set up. Uh, and, uh, and then we know from Max Planck at the turn of the last century, uh, he, he told us that the Frequency would be given by the energy difference of the of these two levels divided by his Planck, his Planck's constant. So uh, and and the idea some of the early, earliest atomic clocks were based on masers or lasers. I think everybody knows lasers means light emission, light amplification by stimulator emission of radiation. And the the idea of m m just stands for microwave. So it turns out that the these the microwave uh, devices, masers operating on the same principle as lasers were actually were the, were the first demonstrated the laser principle. And so the idea then for making a clock, we, we typically, we, for both masers and lasers, we put our atoms inside of a, a resonant cavity. So for light, it would be just two, two mirror cavity. And uh, the, the reason for that is that by the the fact that the light can bounce back and forth inside the cavity, the, the, the radiation energy can build up, and then we can sample a small amount of that radiation and generate time. And so this is, uh, this is the basic idea of a maser or a laser. And then when we get the, you know, the oscillation condition, then uh, we just count cycles of this radiation to, to, to generate time. So I do, I'm going to give a little bit of my personal history along the way here. So I, I was uh, I went started uh, graduate school at Harvard in 1965, and my uh, my thesis advisor was this fellow here, Norman Ramsey, uh, and he he was one of the most famous atomic physicists in the 20th century. Anyway, right around that time when I joined his group, that he and his colleague Dan Kleppner, who, who later went to MIT, they they had invented. The hydrogen maser, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. But uh, 
And I did, these were, this was his team at that time. And this is me, they were trying to get close to the boss, you see. Uh, anyway, my, so my, my Norman Ramsey wanted me, wanted to have precise numbers of the hyperfine energies of, of, the, of the three, uh, three hydrogen isotopes. And so my, my topic was to measure the, make an accurate measurement of the hyperfine frequency of deuterium. And that was the, this was the main result of my thesis. And just to give you an idea, I, I talked about the frequency in terms of energy levels and the energy, two energy levels in the maser hydrogen or deuterium uh, is, uh, is the difference in energy, whether the electron spin and the nuclear spin are aligned or they're, or they're can't, uh, anti-aligned. So that there's energy difference between those two states and that's what gives the basic frequency from which we derive the frequency standard. And uh, there wasn't anything too major about this, this, this project that was, you know, other than the wavelength was quite a bit longer. So it required some different kind of mechanical adjust, uh, you know, differences in the apparatus. But, but anyway, it certainly as a, it was a good, good uh, experience as a graduate student. It certainly, you know, taught me how to make precise control of the environment. And also we were, live, we were generating actually fairly long lived superposition states of, of atoms, which is, uh, you know, kind of a record around that time. Uh, so I'm coming back to the same slide. I won't repeat this again, but the, the one thing I wanted to say in the bottom right here, you can see I, I've described how the, the atoms, when they emit radiation, they can build up radiation in this cavity. Uh, and the, but the, the, there's a, pro, a little bit of a, pro, a technical problem that, uh, that, that is that if the, if the uh, the atoms in the cavity are both oscillators and they're coupled through the radiation. And uh, the problem is if, if the, the frequency that comes out of the cavity is not equal to the, to the atomic transition unless the cavity is tuned exactly at that frequency. And so there, there are methods to do this, but they tend to be a little cumbersome. So uh, what the, I think almost all modern accurate clocks work in just a different mode of operation. And the, and the idea here is very simply, if we have, these are the two energies relevant for the frequency standard, we, we would start the, the atoms in the, in the lower energy state, and then we would apply radiation at a frequency near the transition frequency for a certain amount of time. And then, when, uh, and then we would measure the, the probability of the atom being excited from the ground to the excited state. And when this probability of, uh, is maximum, that would, that would then generate the condition where the late radiation source equaled the, uh, the energy difference of the two atomic levels divided by Planck's constant. So yeah, and then when this condition is met, we just count cycles of the radiation uh, from the radiation source to generate time. I mean, in principle, we could use the absorbed uh, radiation from the atoms, but I'll say how later we can detect the changes the state the atom and the, uh, for the samples we, that I'm gonna talk about where we're talking about single atoms that not very much radiation gets absorbed. By, so we can't use that method. So I, okay, that's what I said. We just, when this condition is met, when we generate time by measuring the, the cycles. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, you know, give you an idea why, why atomic clocks. And this is, you know, this is not a, a you know, a rigorous uh, comparison, but uh, I'm going to compare to uh, pendulum clocks, uh, and uh, this is a, the, the, the considerations I you know think about here also come into play with, for example, quartz crystal clocks. And so anyway, I'm going to just give you a rough idea why atoms are interesting over mechanical devices. And uh, one thing is te temperature sensitivity. So, for example, if the you know most most metals expand when the temperature increases. And if we have a, uh, and so what that means, if the, if the, if the, if this, this, this uh, rod that supports the pendulum expands, then of course the frequency slows down through this expression here. And uh, just to give you an idea of a numerical example, I'm choosing here a, a, a metal or material that has ex expansion coefficient about a hundred times lower than most metals. I mean, I, I, certain glasses are very good in this respect. So anyway, if I just choose this low, very good expansion coefficient, that would give me a fractional frequency sensitivity of the oscillation. Uh, 
uh, just using this simple expression here, of about a part in 10 to the eighth third degree C. And so what about atoms? And uh, atoms that we also have to worry about temperature, but the effect there, the fundamental effect is much more interesting. So uh, basically the, the biggest concern for when we, when we have atoms stored like this, and, and in fact, I should just mention the early atomic clocks based on atoms, the atoms were actually in a glass cell. This was the case for the hydrogen maser. And then the cell was coated with something with low uh, adhesion properties in, in the hydrogen masers that was Teflon. So the atoms would bounce around with, without suffering too much perturbation to their energy levels. Anyway, so if we just, uh, if we use Einstein's for, formula for relativistic time dilation, we get this expression down here that the fractional frequency sensitivity is, is about seven orders of magnitude smaller than it is for the mechanical device. And uh, I, I, I should say that, you know, the one thing, of course, amazing about Einstein is this is not just some, some physical effect that, that, you know, the maybe the bar expands or something like that over here. What Einstein, of course, told us was what was really profound is that that time runs at different rates in moving frames relative to stationary frames. And this was the effect that we have to con contend with on a very small level. So, and also what about how, how reproducible? We'd like, we'd like to generate a lot of uh, standards and have people use them around the world. So what does the frequency depend on? And of course, with the mechanical devices, it depends on manufacturing tolerances and pendulum clocks that the length of the pendulum might change for various uh, 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 various devices that are made. And of course, it also, the pendulum clock depends on the local acceleration of gravity. So it turns out pendulum mechan or crystal clocks are much better than pendulum clocks in that sense because the gravity changes around the surface of the Earth. So uh, for, for, for atoms, what's interesting is all atoms of a particular species, for example, cesium-133 are exactly identical. And uh, at least we, you know, that's what we assume and there's no, no evidence that, to, that, 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 count, that counteracts that assumption. And atoms don't wear out. We can keep the, as long as we can keep the atoms in our device, they, you know, they, they don't wear out. They don't change their properties. So anyway, just to give a little bit more history, the, the cesium clocks, they were, they were based on a, on the hyperfine transition of cesium, similar to the hydrogen maser, uh, the, the devices there they would let a, they would create an atomic beam and then they would irradiate the atomic beam with with uh, with microwaves to determine the, the the transition frequency. Anyway, so that I won't say much about these devices. That, that but uh, anyway, the the cesium, uh, you know, with all the best measurements they had in the mid '60s, they decided uh, that the people defining the standards in the world decided to fix the frequency of cesium hyperfine transition to be 9 billion and so many cycles per second. So, the, the, so in other words, if cesium has exactly the frequency and the issue we have as scientists is trying to make sure we're, we're not introducing any errors. And in fact, this, is, as a, as the, this was the definition made, at, oops, the internationally uh, agreed on definition of the second made in 1967 and uh, that's still it is still the definition. There may be reasons now. I'll, I'll, I think I'll be able to convince you. We might want to change the definition someday, but right now that's that is the definition. So uh, and then I mentioned in the introduction that we'd like to use much higher frequencies that you know than the say the nine billion and so many cycles, you know, per second of the, of the cesium atom. And I give you an example of this, this mercury uh, ion transition, uh, it, you know, is in the ultraviolet. And so the one reason we want to go to high frequencies is for the very simple reason that if we can, if we can count all the cycles, then we define any unit of time, say the second, into finer and finer intervals. So that's one of the one of the main reasons we, we want to go to a very high frequency. And uh, anyway, you can see the frequency here is over 10 to the 15 Hertz as opposed to nine gigahertz for cesium. The other nice thing is we, we, you know, we wanna choose, you know, absorption transitions that are fairly, fairly narrow compared to the overall frequency. And mercury has a absorption feature, its transition, this 
atomic transition here, quadrupole transition, uh, has an absorption rain of a little over a hertz, about 1.6 hertz. And so be and because it's so nice, we can easily tell when our probe oscillator drifts away from this resonance condition. Um, so is it, are atomic clocks a new idea, or uh, rather optic clocks a new idea? And, and the answer is no, uh, no. And I felt one of my colleagues from uh, Boulder, he, he dug up, uh, he wrote an article, he dug up some, some papers from Lord Kelvin and his, his colleague, Peter Tate. And they, 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 uh, they uh, you know, made, made a text about, about absorption spectroscopy and so on. Anyway, they, but in part of that, they had a paragraph saying these, these discoveries, and they were thinking of oscillations in, 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 they were actually thinking of oscillations in sodium, which meant the optical oscillations. Uh, anyway, they indicate this natural uh, standards uh, of matter uh, are readily made an infinite number and uh, absolutely uh, all absolutely like in every physical property. And, uh, in, and they were thinking, as you say, uh, you know, of, of sodium in, in their example. But, so they didn't, they didn't, weren't able to do this yet, but they had, they had all, all this idea is basically right. But one, one sort of amusing thing, and it's not their fault, but they, they also wrote, it's known to be absolutely independent of the position, it, the, its position in the universe. And we, that's not true. And it also has to do with Einstein, but I'll, I'll come back to that, that later. But anyway, they certainly had the basic idea about optical clocks as, as far back as when this text was written. So I'm gonna tell you uh, about ion uh, uh, traps and we, we call, you know, we, and, and uh, the two inventors of the, of, the, of the atomic ion traps are Hans Daimel from the University of Washington and Wolfgang Powell, who's from Bonn. Uh, and anyway, they, uh, they, I won't describe the, the operation of the clock. It, it takes a little while, and I'm sure all the students would understand it, but it takes a little bit longer than I have time for. But the basic idea is we apply a combination of uh, oscillating and static electric potentials to this electrode structure. And what it does is it creates, creates a three-dimensional harmonic well in the center of the trap. So a, a good, you know, good 2D analog of this is like a marble in the bowl, and but we do it in three dimensions. Um, so anyway, I mentioned this mercury ion uh, transition and, uh, that we worked on, and so the the person leading this 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 project in our in our lab in Boulder, Colorado, was Jim Burke. So he was my colleague there for thirty five years, and so uh, anyway, we 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 fix on this transition here, the one I've already described, and. Uh, the transition frequency corresponds to a wavelength of about 282 nanometers. Uh, uh, and I'll say a little bit now how about how we do the measurements there. So, so we need a way to detect when the atom absorbs the radiation. And what we do then is we, we there's, this is a common technique in atomic physics. We, we, we can find another transition in mercury. And this one has, a, has the upper state has a very short lifetime. So we can scatter many photons per second, a couple hundred million or more per second. Oops, and uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, and, and so we can, uh, so the idea is let's suppose, this is our clock transition and let's suppose we start the atom in the ground state and then we, they, we try to excite it with the clock radiation. If the clock radiation is, is, is not tuned correctly, then the atom remains in, the, in this ground state. And then when we turn on this laser, we see lots of scattering. On the other hand, when the, when the atom uh, is, uh, is promoted to the excited state, that is when, it's, when the laser is in resonance with the, the energy difference of the, of the states, then we promote the atom up there. And then we, when we turn the, uh, the, the second laser on, we don't see any scattering. And this is a, this is a pretty, a dramatic effect even with one one ion one atom uh, is that we can in this experiment here we just we left both laser oscillators on at the same time but the idea uh, when you know we, when we'd see lots of scattering that meant the, the atom was in the ground state and when we saw very little it means it was promoted to excited state and in fact you see a little bit of scattered light here for, but it, but it's just a, you know random scattered light from the 
from the apparatus. But anyway, the, the key point here is that we can discriminate these, these two levels the atom is, uh, is in by just setting a discriminator about halfway up this, you know, up the chart, up the, uh, you know, that view graph there. And we can tell what essentially 100% when, if, when the atom has absorbed the radiation. So you know, actually we can also see a, a single atom. Uh, uh, we can't, unfortunately with mercury, it's in the, the transition is in the ultraviolet, so we can't see it with our eyes, but we can, uh, we, you know, we basically had constructed a, a UV sensitive, uh, uh, you know, camera and basically not any more sophisticated than what you can buy, uh, you know, in your, in the stores, uh, but it worked in the ultraviolet. So, so we needed that property. Uh, and actually we could make, Pictures, you know, just by by imaging the the you know the scattered light, we could say make a picture, and here's a picture of a single ion, and 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 just to give you uh, you know right, one interesting thing is this the size of this dot here, the diameter of the dot we see with our optics, it's about 500 times larger than the wave packet size of the atom, and and we have a way we have ways to determine the wave packet size of the atom. So it's basically just blurred out because the optics is not perfect. But anyway, we can see a single uh, ion uh, this way. And actually there's, uh, there's other ions. Barium is a good example. Singly ionized barium actually fluoresces. That is this, the corresponding transition to this one here is in the, in the blue and you can actually see it with your eye. It's pretty dramatic. Uh, so another thing we, you know, this is a whole separate topic, but uh, it turns out about the time we were developing, we, we were also trying to develop ways to cool the ions using radiation pressure. And uh, I, I, you know, again, I won't have time to go through it in detail, but students would get it pretty quickly. But the, the basic idea is, suppose we have the, this, our atom here is moving against the laser beam. Uh, then when, it, when in that condition, the, 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 the atom observes the frequency of the transition to be shifted up. So what we do is we tune the, the, the resonance frequency of the, uh, or the laser frequency to a value below where the atom wants to absorb. And then when the atom moves against the laser beam, the first order Doppler shift uh, brings it into resonance. And, and also then we get the momentum transfer when the uh, light is scattered. And there's, of course, when the atom moves in the same direction as light, it's shifted farther out of resonance. So there's this strong differential effect, and we we get we basically get damping when we tune this laser somewhat below resonance. And just to give you, an, I won't go through all the, that's a whole topic by itself. But anyway, we can by cooling the ions, we can dramatically suppress the this relativistic time relationship. And just to give you an example with mercury. Uh, we, the, the, the apparatus in this, in this picture here was at room temperature. So the ions were also, if we didn't do anything, they would be at, at around room temperature. But this radiation pressure cooling then allowed us to cool the, 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 uh, the equivalent temperature of the ions down to about a millikelvin. So we could suppress this time dilation shift by almost, almost a million by doing this cooling. So that was just one of the features we used. So this is a picture of our, our group in, in 1979, and that's me in my younger days. And I, I actually did the, the cooling experiments that we did with uh, my colleague, Bob Drillinger. And there, very not long after that, Jim Burke was the guy who was the uh, main person behind the Mercury clock that, that joined us in along with Wayne Atano, who was kind of our, uh, our best theorist in the group by far. So, um, Anyway, so uh, there's a lot of details I can't go through, but uh, you know, this, this took many years. We started this project in 1982, and it went it went for almost 25 years. And uh, they they so I, I told you a little bit about some of the nice features and the trapping. You know, the trapping actually just one thing I didn't say, but the, since we're trapping, the average velocity goes to zero, and that whoops, that gets rid of the first order Doppler effect. And then the laser cooling then, then can suppress this time dilation shift. And in this, uh, when in this later days, we got we actually made the vacuum system be at four Kelvin, and so uh, basically all almost all background gas except helium is condensed out on the walls of the vacuum system, so we could suppress the environmental perturbations and 
collisions with helium actually didn't bother us very much. So, so that was that was something we had to add. And anyway, after this more than 20 years, uh, uh, we, we, we finally, you know, uh, with, under Jim Merkwitz's leadership, we got down to a situation where the, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty of the mercury clock expressed fractionally uh, was lower than the best cesium clocks in, in the mid 2000s. And so this is the first time a clock since the, the, since the definition of the second that it turned out to be better than the cesium in terms of how well we could control the, the frequency shifts. So we have, I've mentioned the time dilation shift and, and there's many things we have to correct for. The most common things in experimental physics we have to worry about are stray magnetic and electric fields. And actually one of the radiation fields we have to, electric field effects we have to worry about is due to thermal radiation, the so-called black body radiation. And, uh, and, and, and that you know, pervades the, you know, all of our apparatus and the room that we're at and so on. Actually, sort of an interesting number is that the, for thermal radiation, that, you know, in the room you're sitting in, the, the electric field amplitude is about 10 volts per centimeter. Of course, we don't, we don't know that because we can't, our eyes just aren't sensitive to that. And, and uh, so there's other interesting effects. And I, of course, have mentioned Einstein and, and so we, we, we now know about not worrying about time dilation due to atomic motion. But Einstein in his general theory of relativity was also told us, told us about another kind of shift and it's called the potential, uh, gravitational potential redshift. It's, it's called by that uh, from its astronomers because basically the idea is that an atom sitting in a gravitational potential, its frequency of radiation will be shifted down. And that's where this, this term redshift comes in. Any light emitted from, a, from a, you know, a distant body will be shifted down uh, in frequency. And so we have to worry about that shift. And just to give you an idea of the size, it's, it, um, the redshift uh, at the surface of the Earth is about a part in 10 to the eighth uh, and, uh, uh, from this gravitational potential uh, shift. And so we have to, when we're comparing blocks, we have to, we have to take care of that. And uh, so for example, if we, if we wanna compare two blocks, we have to, we, we, have a, we can drive a simple expression where delta H is, is the relative heights of the two clocks. And uh, we get a, a, a change in this redshift of, uh, uh, given by this expression here. And, and, and it, it, it's interesting, it's not a very, uh, interest is not a very significant effect in, on a human time scale. And to give you an example of why that's true is that, so here's a story, suppose you and a, a twin sibling were separated at birth and you live at sea level and your twin lives at about 1.6 kilometers above the sea level, that's Boulder, say would be Boulder, Colorado. Then it turns out after 80 years, your, your twin will only be about a millisecond older than you. So, so it's not, Effect that, that you know affects our lives in any interesting way, but it's certainly you know we can you know it affects uh, the clocks that we, that we we that we play with, and we have to we have to we have to be able to measure that. So just uh, you know, kind of as a fun example of of uh, you know how this gets how we can see this shift, and at least in the you know and on our scale of things is that uh, so we later we later shifted to. Uh, Mercury, or sorry, aluminum ions from mercury, and it, they, they have they have radiation frequency. The clock frequency is just about the same, but they had some other interesting properties that we can that were made things a little better than it was working with mercury. So, and this one of those things was that the upper state lifetime of the transition was about that's about two hundred times longer than the than the uh, radiation time of of the of the mercury transition. So it was this 200 times more narrow and therefore gave us an even tighter precision when we uh, synchronize the clock to the transition. So anyway, for this little demonstration, we call this clock number one. It doesn't look much like a clock, of course. So in this silver tube here, that's where the, the ion trap and, and some vacuum equipment was. And all this other stuff you see on the table is, you know, a lot of optics and there's laser beams on the far end of the table here and, uh, you know, to guide the laser beams through the trap and control the 
their, their frequency and their intensity and so on. Anyway, what we're going to call, we'll call this clock for number one. And then in, in, a, in, a, in a room adjacent to this one, it was actually to this, just to the right of this figure that I'm showing you here, there was a clock, another nearly identical clock. And uh, we call that clock number two. And then what we did is we measured the ratio of the frequencies of the two clocks. And there was some error. This is a little, a little better than a part in 10 to the 17. But the basic idea, the frequencies were, were the same as we expected to this level of precision. And uh, the, it, it, we can actually get down lower than this, about an order of mag magnitude lower than this in terms of precision. But for this demonstration, this was sufficient. So basically, and these are the two guys, uh, David Leibrand and David Hume, that were, uh, were um, the main people on this experiment. So anyway, what a... Uh, what we did then is one of uh, one of the postdocs working on this experiment. This is James, the back of James Chow, and you can see what he's done is he he's put uh, jacks underneath this the clock that I just showed you, clock number one, and uh, basically he raised it up. Uh, sorry, if I can. Make <laughs> so he raises it up by about thirty three centimeters. And you could see the shift in the clock. The, the, the clock that's raised and now runs faster than the, uh, you know, because it's in a weaker gravitational potential. Uh, and we, you know, the, again, this wasn't an accurate measurement, or we could certainly see the effect. And uh, so let me just give you an idea of where we're at. Now, the, certainly the, you know, you know, the best atomic clocks now are based on, they are based on optical transition. Uh, but, you know, and I've, I've just talked about, ion, uh, you know, charged atoms, ions, atomic ions, but neutral ions are also very good. And, and they have said they even have some advantages that one being that they can play with more atoms than we can with ions. So the, the, the signal gets better when, with larger numbers. Anyway, they, uh, one, one thing that they, that's, you know, uh, Use a lot with optical or the neutral atom experiments is they can make a trap, and it looks you know in a two dimensional version it looks kind of like an egg crate. But basically, at each one of the 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 position of these of these wells due to this optical lattice, an atom can sit, and so they they could build up many atoms. And so this this is one reason why the, they could measure with higher precision than we could with our mercury ion that, that is with higher signal to noise. Uh, was just that they were working with larger numbers. And anyway, I'm not going to, you know, there, there's a lot to say here, but uh, let me just give you an idea of kind of where things are at right now. So sir, right now, currently the best clocks, which are the optical clocks, have an uncertainty uh, expressed fractionally of about a part in 10 to the 18. And I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this reference here. I mean, it's not the most recent one, as you can see, the, the, the results have been updated, but I, I, if you want to find out a bit more, I'd go to this reference first because it, uh, you know, it covers all the different clocks and, and gives a good summary, I think. Um, so let me say, so what about the future? Uh, and, and it's now it's clear that the, you know, the optical clocks are, are better, more we can control their, their uncertainties better than we can with the, uh, uh, you know, with the, than the cesium clocks. And, now uh, there's you know there's way we can you know one one thing you might ask well let's re redefine the second and people are talk people are talking about that but nobody's made any strong moves yet and the reason is that there's there's lots of clocks that are better than than the cesium atom you know but but it's not clear which one is the best so I mean I think people people carefully make a choice it may may be a while and and certainly. Uh, you know, right now the seizing clock is still the definition because, it, but people are thinking about the people in international committees are thinking about maybe there's maybe they'll define uh, the second based on one of these optical transitions. Uh, so there's another. I, I won't. This is a whole lecture by or more by itself. Is it, we can we can we can approve the precision of measurements with so-called entangled in this case spin squeeze states, and I won't. Be able to say much about that, but there's special entangled states where the measurement precision uh, scales, uh, for, uh, you know, and without this entanglement that scales is one over the number of the square root of the number of particles, it now scales is one over the number of particles. And we can 
we can actually, we can demonstrate this effect. We, it hasn't been incorporated into a, a real accurate clock yet, but that's, that's certainly going to come. Uh, the other thing is we can, we still think about navigation. And, and of course, uh, you know, one centimeter is pretty good for most of our ordinary day uses. But one, one, one thing people are thinking about is that, for example, that maybe we, maybe we could measure earth strains. That is, suppose we have two, two locations on earth and, and, and there's a strain in the earth where, uh, you know, one, 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 one area uh, moves higher than the other one. Uh, that's due, due to strain, and we can we can we can detect that now at the centimeter scale. And so th this is this might be interesting because it's, strain is also always a precursor of earthquakes. And so maybe maybe someone will come up with a way where we could use our clocks to maybe help or at least warn against earthquakes. And uh, that, of course, there's all sorts of fundamental science. We, you know, we're we're always trying to test the basic strengths of uh, uh, forces of nature, and one question asks: Are they are they constant in times? And one thing that our lab and other labs have done is make clocks based on different elements. For example, we use compared mercury uh, to aluminum, and uh, or rather, rather to cesium in that case. But anyway, we could we, you know we we could look compare the ratio of the frequencies over a long time, and for example, see if the forces were constant in time. And we you know we couldn't do it. You know, with absolute accuracy, but we could certainly set limits on how much the basic, <coughs> pardon me, basic forces were changing relative to each other. And there's also schemes. You know, of course, we've heard a lot about gravity waves in the last several years, and there's way, ways people are thinking about how you could use, uh, you know, the relative frequency shift to two clocks that are separated by distance to, to to measure gravitational waves. And of course, as we're always finding trying to find ways that you know, maybe Einstein wasn't right. So far, he, he's just fine. But the, you know, if we find deviations from Einstein's theory of relativity, that might signal some, some new kind of forces, new physics. So that's certainly attractive. We're always trying to think of things like that. So let me say, so, you know, you know, yeah, you saw the group that I, uh, the size of our group in 1976. And, and, I, and this was our group up to, December 2018, and it got up to, you know, times to 30 people. And so there was, you know, the, oh, these are the people doing all the work. We had several clocks. Also in, in the mid nineties, we, we, you know, we, we saw that we could use our atoms as quantum bits. So we, about half the group here was working on quantum computation using iron. So, but they use almost exactly the same techniques is why we could double up on this. So anyway, but you know, not surprising, there are many people working on this that that, that, that contributed to the success the success we had. Uh, and I also want to mention at NIST we had very good leadership. And the one uh, thing that was very nice, uh, our bosses uh, for most of the work, uh, you know, during my time there, uh, the, the the laboratory director, her name was Catherine Gibby, and she, you know, she basically let us do uh, determine what we were they didn't tell us what to do and uh we could make that decision ourselves so she you know they, they gave us a lot of support and basically let us make the de scientific decisions and then that her her position was taken over by another colleague Cara Williamson uh, after uh, after uh her term ended and uh also we we do you know we get uh support from NIST directly but we also get support from the outside, and, and in particular, for example, the Office of Naval Research, they're interested in time for navigation, so they, they, they fund us. So we also got some funding from these outside agencies as well. So is, I should ask, is there enough time? Do I have about five minutes more? I could just say, give an idea of my path through. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, so I'm gonna, I'm, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am, and and so I, you know, I I was I was born during World War II, but my parents had lived through what called the Great Depression in the U.S. and economic depression, and so I mean they were lucky because they both had jobs during this this time period, but many people didn't. You know, many many people were in really bad shape because they couldn't get work. Anyway, because of that experience, so they they. 
my parents always emphasized that, that to my sister and I that, that we should we should we should do well in school so we go to college and get an education to find a good job. So there was this strong emphasis on grades in school, and I and my sister and I liked school, so it wasn't that wasn't a problem. The other thing is my, I had the advantage. My my, my father had encouraged me with a lot of simple mathematical game starting when I, when I when I was very young. And so, you know, that got me interested in. Uh, anyway, but even in spite of this emphasis on getting, you know, good getting good marks in school, I, I had I had a lot of freedom to explore. So when I was when I was younger, it was building model planes. And the, and then when I got to be near high school age, uh, we, my buddies and I, we were interested in cars. And in fact, I I I bought my first car when I was 14 and I, I couldn't drive it till I was 16. But we, you know, I was so crazy about cars that my my father brought it home and I, I worked on it for the next year and a half, sort of tore this car completely down apart and built it back up. And uh anyway, it taught me a lot about mechanics, which is actually uh, you know, a useful thing for my later career. Uh and then uh just to give you an idea, after high school, I, 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 went, uh, to, I went to the University of California for my undergraduate work. And I started at uh, the Davis campus, which was near to where I grew up, uh, Sacramento, California. And so my first two years were there. And it had, it had, it would, had primarily been an agricultural school and was, was you know, diversifying, diversifying to all subjects by the time I came there, but still, the, you know, Berkeley campus, which I think everybody knows, is that, that was the place for physics. And so I spent my last two years there and it was easy to transfer, just needed to fill out a piece of paper, basically. Um, oops, sorry. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, so that's where I graduated, got my undergraduate degree. And then I, it was mentioned already, I went to graduate school at, at Harvard University. And then I, I went to the, did my postdoc at, at, at uh, at University of Washington, and actually, my advisor was Hans Stamel. He was one of the inventors of the of the of the of the ion trap. And uh, actually, I worked on in that in that time. I worked on trapping electrons, but a lot of the ideas applied to atomic ions, which I was able to use later. So anyway, that's that's about it. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm. I'm happy to an answer any questions you might have, so. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. I'm sure that I'm speaking on the behalf of entire audience watching us right now, that you really inspired us with your groundbreaking thoughts as you were beginning on this journey and presented us with simple yet brilliant implementable ideas while instilling a new perspective in our lives. So we will now begin with the Q&A session to answer the few of our audience's questions. The first question that the audience has for you is, have you always had a keen interest in physics or did it bloom during your time at Berkeley? I see. No, actually, I, you know, I, I always liked mathematics. And, uh, uh, but, in, but in my last year of high school, you know, I, I took a, the introductory physics class and so that, that got me really interested and I, I, you know, I, I, what I liked about physics was, you know, rel for at least relatively simple math for a mathematician, you know, we could use that math to explain things around us. And so I think that, you know, I always liked that, uh, you know, that mix between math and physics. And in fact, I started, when I started uh, uh, college, I was, I was a math major, but I, I, I was taking physics classes from the start and I, I decided that's really where I wanted to go. So when I transferred to Berkeley, then I, I became a, a physics major. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that's <laughs> that's kind of my, my story. And then I actually, I, as I mentioned, I did a, a postdoc after that and then, uh, and then went to NIST in 1975. And uh, anyway, I still collaborate with those guys. It's a, Anyway, that's that's my long story short. That was quite insightful, sir. Uh, the next question is, uh, you are responsible for the origin of quantum information. So how did the discovery unfold? Was there a Eureka moment? 
No, wait, wait. I, I wasn't. A, I wasn't a discoverer of infer quantum information. I mean, I think that the one, the one thing uh, I, I, I just mentioned briefly, but it turned out we could, you know, in the in the idea of quantum information, you know, you're thinking about quantum bits, and uh, you know the the and, and a bit, you know, classical good bit in one one or you know two state one or two states one of two states. And the nice thing in, in you know, our atoms, when we make out of a two-state atom, we could make what are so-called superposition. And in some sense, they're, they're in both states at the, one, at the same time. I, I better not go too far because this is another whole lecture, but basically that what we were able to uh, adapt, you know, our, our, the apparatuses that we were using for our clocks to do some simple early demonstrations. In fact, I think we, you know, we, I think we can say we were the first ones to do logic gates uh, on individual uh, quantum systems, and that was in 1995. So anyway, but you know that you know the, the field is just you know huge field now, and there's many many people working on atoms to make you know quantum computers, and but there's also solid state systems, superconducting qubits, and things like that. So it's it's a really big enterprise by now. That was very inspiring, sir. Uh, so the last question that the audience has is, uh, what was your inspiration and motivation behind winning the Nobel Prize? And what message would you like to convey to the young aspiring physicist? So, I mean, I, I think, you know, one thing I would say, I mean, I, the, you know, being recognized with the Nobel Prize was wonderful, of course, but I mean, the first thing I would say is you don't want to choose a field to win prizes. <laughs> You know, in, in the Nobel Prize is a good example. And, you know, there's just so many, few given relative to the number of good scientists out there that, you know, I think if you go in with the idea of winning prizes, you'll be disappointed. So I would say, you know, that it, what very simply the thing that's, I, I mean, I just like, I think all, I and my colleagues, we just like the work that we're doing. I mean, we like fun to play with the lasers, you know, and then <laughs> Nice if we can do interesting things with them, but just the all the techniques we use are, are fun to learn about and, and implement. So I think that you know the real reward I think for for all of us is just being able to do this interesting work. And I actually you asked, yeah, once one piece of advice I could give is you know to the students is don't I think you know you know, you can, you know, you want to try to find something that you that you really like, otherwise you're not going to, you know, work on it hard enough to be really good at it. And, and I would say, even if you change your mind, you know, you, you may change your field, uh, you know, you, you just find something you like, and then you'll work hard at it. And I think if you do that, you'll be successful at almost anything you, you take on. Thank you, sir. This has been an amazing session. We are simply elated you could join us today. Also, thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in. We hope you all really enjoyed this session. I am Samriddhi Darak signing off. Until next time, this is Technovanza VJTI. Okay, yeah. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, sir. Sir.